Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk again to Bassam Zawadi. You are most welcome, sir. Salam alaikum, Paul. Yeah, thank you for having me again on your channel. Welcome, salam. And for those who don't know, Bassam is a Muslim author who writes extensively about issues related to Islamic apologetics and Islamic modernist discourse. He has a master's degree in philosophy. His work can be found at his academia page and his blog, islamicdiscourse.substack.com. Both, by the way, are well worth following. And I will link to them in the description below. There are two articles in particular that are linked to, and I mentioned them towards the end as well. Now, today, Bassam will be giving us a critique of the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, a critique of the Christian doctrine of the incarnation. Now, just a heads up that this presentation will be quite demanding uh, philosophically. So extra concentration is required uh, for me, not, not least of all, and everyone else, perhaps. So, um, Bassam, would you like to introduce us to this topic? Sure. Uh, so, you know, today, inshallah, I, uh, I intend to speak about the Christian doctrine of the, inc of the incarnation, which is a central creed of mainstream Christian theology. Uh, it is the belief that one of the persons in the triune Godhead, namely God the Son, uh, assumed human nature in the man of Jesus Christ for the primary purpose of atoning for the sins of mankind. And so, inshallah, I'd like to maybe share my presentation and mm. take you guys through it. Please. I do, I do. I do like that, by the way, Bassam. You, you, this is very nice, uh, very colorful and uh, tasteful. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great. So let us go through the agenda for today's uh, presentation. So uh, we'll start off by exploring what mainstream Orthodox Christianity teaches about the incarnation mm. so that we focus the remainder of our presentation specifically on this conception as opposed to heretical and unorthodox formulations of doctrine. We will then explore some of the most popular incarnational models that Christian theologians and philosophers have put forth in trying to flesh out the doctrine in mm. a coherent manner while struggling to abide by orthodox boundaries. Then, inshallah, we'll take a critical look at a popular attempt made by Christians who try to point out Islamic beliefs that are supposedly analogous mm. to the incarnation. And then we'll conclude. Fascinating. In the fifth century, um, an ecumenical council, which you know, an ecumenical council is basically a, a meeting of bishops that come together to uh, discuss matters pertaining to Christian doctrine. Um, an ecumenical council of the Christian church took place in the city of Chalcedon. Uh, so, some people pronounce it differently. Some people pronounce it Chalcedon yeah. or Chalcedon or Chalcedon, uh, different pronunciations out there. Um, in that council, Christians reached an agreement about what the doctrine of incarnation entails. Hmm. And the results of the council were embraced by most Christians, including Catholics, um, Anglicans, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, and even most Protestants. And most Christians today would take serious issue with any conception or model of the incarnation which steps outside the bounds permitted by Chalcedonian Orthodoxy. Yeah. So what is the Chalcedonian conception of the incarnation. Mm. Um, I'll read out what it teaches and then offer a summary of the key points. Um, the teachings of Chalcedon on the incarnation are as follows. Wherefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one voice confess our Lord Jesus Christ, one and the same Son, the same perfect and Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same consisting of a reasonable soul and a body, 
of one substance with the Father as touching the Godhead, the same of one substance with us as touching the manhood, like us in all things apart from sin. Begotten of the Father before the ages as touching the Godhead, the same in the last days for us and for our salvation, born from the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, as touching the manhood, one in the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being in no way abolished because of the union, but rather the characteristic property of each nature being preserved and concurring into one person and one substance, not as if Christ were parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten God, Word, Lord, Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from the beginning spoke concerning him and our Lord Jesus Christ instructed us and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. Mm. So the key points we could derive from this are the following. First, the human Jesus is the same undivided person as God the Son. Their identity is the same. Second, to qualify as a human incarnate, Jesus must have had both a human soul and body. Third, Jesus must have been human in every aspect, except that he was sin sinless. Fourth, the divine natures and human natures of Christ must not have mixed in a manner which formed a hybrid nature. Rather, each of the natures must have enjoyed wholeness in their own right. Um, in other words, God the Son did not metamorphosize into a human being, but rather assumed a human nature while maintaining his divine nature. Fifth, the divine nature must not have undergone any intrinsic change during the incarnation process. Now, the challenges posed by this doctrine are immediately evident. Um, how can a single person assume two different natures ascribed with contradictory attributes simultaneously? How can the same person be omniscient yet ignorant about certain things at the same time? Similarly, how can the same person be omnipotent yet limited in power concurrently? And so on. Mm. To make this reconciliation task even more challenging, Christians must not only respect the boundaries of Chalcedonian orthodoxy in order to evade being charged with heresy, but must also ensure that they strictly adhere to perfect being theology. Perfect being theology is the classic theistic doctrine which teaches that God is infinitely perfect in his attributes. He is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, and so on. Thus, any attempt to make sense of the incarnation cannot compromise these attributes for God. So how have Christians attempted to address these difficulties. Now, in my paper, uh, Can God Become Incar Incarnate, which you kindly link to in the description. I'll link to below, by the way. I do encourage people to uh, have a read of it. Great, thank you. Um, I looked at five attempts made by Christian theologians and, philosoph and philosophers in the academic literature. I had no interest in looking at attempts made by the Christian laity or unsophisticated preachers. I only looked at what respected Christian figures have said, either classically or in the contemporary academic world. You know, in order to ensure giving voice to the most articulate and robust defenses Christians have offered in addressing this issue. And it's only fair that we do that. I, I, I just commend you, uh, just if I may, uh, Abbasim, for doing that, because it's easy to uh, for, for anyone, be they Muslim or Jew or, or agnostic or atheist, to 
uh, poke fun at some Christian beliefs uh, by taking the worst examples, articulations of those beliefs, straw manning Christian faith or Christian belief in the process. But what you're doing is, is should be the gold standard. You're taking the best and most articulate representative uh, expressions of Christian belief and critiquing those. And I think that's a, that's an excellent methodology. So I commend you for that. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we, we do so in the hope of reciprocation. For the yeah, other reciprocal, side of the yes, reciprocal yes. Uh, methodology, yeah. So the five incarnational models that I looked at in my paper were as follows. The compositional model, the canonic Christological model, the two consciousnesses model, the neo-Apollinarianism model, and the divine pre-conscious model. The first three are popular ones, uh, which are also not very controversial within mainstream Christian circles because they outwardly appear to respect the bounds of Chalcedonian orthodoxy. As for the last two, they are not so popular and are also controversial, according to many critics, for appearing to come across as contravening the boundaries set by Chalcedon. Um, in today's presentation, inshallah, I will only be going through the first three models as they're the most wild, wi widely held ones. And yeah. as for the other two, if one is curious and, and interested, he could read about them in my, in my article, inshallah. You know, if one is interested in this subject, it wouldn't hurt taking a look at these two in, uh, you know, additional models and you know, given their featured presence in the academic literature. And, and who knows, these theories of the incarnation might become growingly popular over the course of time. Yeah. Um, so let's start off with the first one, the compositional model. The compositional model posits that the incarnate Christ was a composite being with both human and divine attributes. Christians try to express this model by using what is called a reduplicative strategy. So for example, they would say that Christ is omnipotent in virtue of his divine nature, yet not omnipotent in virtue of his human nature. And an analogy that is used is that of a red apple. So a red apple is red in virtue of its skin, yet not red in virtue of its inner core. Hence, by utilizing the reduplicative approach, one could use a method of expression that allows him to avoid using language that ends up assigning contradictory attributes to the single person that is Jesus Christ. Mm. And this model was the most popular one classically and was espoused by uh, prominent Christian theologians such as Thomas Aquinas. And also by reading the works of classical Muslim scholars who engaged with Christians, we can deduce that they were responding to this model of the incarnation. However, there are serious problems with this incarnational model. Firstly, there is the problem of identity. If Jesus Christ is a composite or conglomerate of the divine God, the Son, in addition to a human soul plus body, then that means that Jesus Christ is more than God the Son, since God the Son becomes a part of Jesus Christ, as opposed to being identical to Jesus Christ as Christian theology teaches. Christian theology teaches that they are identically the same person. The alternative here would be to view the composite being called Jesus Christ as some kind of impersonal conglomerate without an identity. But obviously, this would also run counter to Christian theology, which teaches that Jesus Christ is a person. So in short, you cannot say that the identity of Jesus Christ, the alleged divine human incarnate being, is identical 
to God the Son, and at the same time, say that God the Son is only a part of Jesus Christ. This is because the part cannot be identical to the whole. It's like saying that the engine of the car is identical to the car itself, which is clearly false. Secondly, let us push the problem of identity even further. The reduplicative strategy that was employed may help the Christian avoid using contradictory modes of articulation and expression, but it only does so in a limited fashion. And more importantly, it does not help the Christian coherently express his theology when answering even the most basic of questions when, when, when probed. So take the following question, for example. Did the person, Jesus Christ, actually die or not? Christians cannot respond by saying that the person, Jesus Christ, died in virtue of his human nature, but did not die in virtue of his divine nature. That is because we are speaking about one single person here. He either died or he did not. Christian theology does not teach that some kind of abstract human nature died on the cross, but that Jesus Christ, the person, died on the cross. Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ, the human being, is the same person as God the Son. Yet God the Son cannot die because gods do not die. But if God the Son did not die, and he is the same person as Jesus Christ, and that means that Jesus Christ also cannot have died. I've noticed, I'd just say without yeah. entering into the uh, the issues there, but just um, observationally, uh, whenever this question is raised, particularly usually by Muslims, when they ask Christians this very question, uh, you know, did Jesus die on the cross or, or what died on the cross? There is usually a great deal of confusion about this. So in fact, there's always a great deal. Of, it, there's never a clear uh, coherent answer and and in, the further you probe it the more confused and confusing the whole subject becomes because they, they are, are they saying that god died or didn't die is god immortal or not immortal and the identity of jesus is god and man it, it really is a sort of basic question and yet it really does elicit such profound confusion uh in the responses virtually always uh, actually and this is not just on those who are not tutored in the e e even in the most kind of uh, educated christians are very confused about this so it it's it's fascinating such sort a of basic question is uh, uh is something that christians can't give a straightforward answer to a, as you rightly say i think yeah absolutely i mean you know uh, mm -hmm. such a basic question about christian theology cannot be answered in a straightforward manner on this incarnational model at the very least without landing into serious logical problems. Yeah. So, so yes, perhaps, perhaps the reduplicative approach is a convenient linguistic strategy mm. that helps the Christian avoid using self-contradictory language when articulating the incarnation, but it's hardly a viable metaphysical conceptual strategy Yep. That makes sense of how the idea of a divine incarnate Jesus evades the charge of being self-contradictory and, and incoherent. Yep. Thirdly, there is the problem of identifying the essence. What is the essence of this composite being of Christ? Every being, including God himself, has an essence. The, the composite being called Jesus, which is composed of the divine person that is God the Son, in addition to having a human soul and body, combines two substances, the, the divine and human, that are supposedly not merged together, but remain distinct and apart, according to Christian theology. Thus, what then is the nature or, or substance, or, or, substance or, or essence of this composite being, which itself comprises of two distinct substances or essences that are divine and human? Mm. What, what classification of being is this? Like, what is the ontic status, the ontological status of Jesus Christ as a composite being? Fourthly, 
it is very difficult to see how the compositional model of the incarnation aligns with an important facet of Chalcedonian orthodoxy, which, which states that there must be no division in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, recall what the Council of Chalcedon said. They said, Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Well, on the compositional model, when we speak of the divine God, the Son, as being omniscient, while Jesus, the human, was ignorant, then there is a clear distinction or division here, the, you know, despite us speaking about the same person. So in conclusion, there are serious problems with the compositional model, not, not only in that it lacks rational rigor, but also appears to fail the standards of sound Christian orthodoxy as well. Hmm. I mean, but many, many. So I, I've heard many senior. Um, what well, heard? I've read many senior theologians, patristic scholars at Oxford and elsewhere say that the Chalcedonian definition gives the outward formula, but it doesn't tell us how this formula is correct or true. It doesn't give us the inner metaphysical or philosophical justification and workings out. It just gives the the, the parameters of, of within which orthodoxy is to be expressed. But that's the point. It, it, when it's tested using logical, philosophical observations like you're doing, it doesn't seem to cohere. It, it does tend to break apart. But so it's a legacy that the council has left later uh, thinkers to try and work out how can this be true in the light of the, 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 fact, the factors that you mentioned. Yeah. You know, if, if, if someone reads my paper on the other two models that I said that I'm not going to cover today, the, those that propose those models, uh, you know, get very creative in how they <laughs> reinterpret uh, yeah. the Chalcedonian uh, statement. Um, and because uh, you know, they know they, they don't, they don't want to come out and explicitly say that they're going against the, 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 the you know, what, what Chalcedon said, but they have a fanciful way of reinterpreting uh, what it says. So it gets, this is uh, very true. Uh, if you want to see some, some very, very neat uh, intellectual gymnastics, uh, yeah, yeah. It makes the that. Olympics uh, look like a, a tea party, then I recommend you read these books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. So coming to the second model, um, which is the canonic Christological model, uh, also known as kenoticism. Um, even though the word um, kenosis used to be used synonymously with the incarnation since the patristic times, the, the actual incarnational model itself only arose in the 19th century. Yeah. So what is kenoticism? Well, it basically teaches that God must have, in some manner or the other, um, divested himself of at least some of his attributes or functions in order to become a human incarnate. Hmm. Um, there are broadly two kinds of canonic models. So the first is what we call standard ontological canoticism. So this suggests that God voluntarily gave up some of his attributes only to reclaim them again later. In other words, God voluntarily chose to stop being omnipotent and omniscient and so on for a period of time only to reclaim his attributes again at a later stage. And some who hold to this view of ontological canonicism would, would say that certain attributes, such as omnipotence and omniscience, are not even essential to, divi to divinity, but rather accidental. Yes. Meaning it is not essential for God to remain God, to have these properties at all times. Kind of, kind of similar to how it is not essential for a human being to see or hear or, or have arms or legs in order to be human. That's, that's the reasoning at play here. Therefore, those who subscribe to ontological kenoticism would say that Jesus remained God despite not being omnipotent and omniscient temporarily during the process of incarnation, since these are allegedly 
not essential properties for yeah. God to yeah. always have. The, and the, the, they're disposable, de they're detachable attributes. So that there's this there's this thing called deity. I don't know what yeah. it is, but and these attributes that you've itemized are detachable, and yet the yeah. The, the God head still remains divine, even though he's, he may not be more powerful. He may not be uh, uh, or, or knowing he may not be this. He may not even be immortal, but he's still God. And I found when I've asked Christians, having been through this process, well, what is this deity that's left? Could you please define it for me? You know, theology, that that's when I hit, I hit a brick wall. But I, I, I just want to stress that this whole kinetic Christological model is not a, a, an invention of later the, theologians purely. It has its roots on In a uh, re refle yes, reflection oh, sorry, yeah. on a letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians mm -hmm. in the uh, chapter number two. And if you look at the uh, chapter two of Philippians, you'll see Paul's exposition of what is taken to be a kinetic Christology. So it's not just an invention out of later theologians' minds. It's a scriptural idea that they have developed uh, in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So, 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 yeah. So they would say that these are not essential properties for God to always have, and that this act of kenosis or divestment of divine properties permitted Jesus to also become a man simultaneously. Yeah. The 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 second kind of kenoticism is what is deemed functional kenoticism. So this states that God made it a binding choice upon himself mm. not to exercise his attributes. Yes. So God did not do away with the property of omnipotence, but he did make it binding upon himself to be limited in power. So he self-limited his power. So Christians who hold to functional canoticism would say that God's attributes of omnipotence and omniscience are what we call dispositional properties. This means that these properties, they are essential to God. They are essential to God, but it is not essential that they are always exercised or enacted. So going back to human analogies to understand this point further, it's, it's kind of like saying it's essential for human beings to have brains, but it is not essential for their brains to function at full capacity in order for them to remain human. So those who subscribe to functional canopicism would argue that Jesus was able to become man since he was self-bound to not enact the divine properties he had. Okay, can, can, can you, so can you just, how do, how do they explain, you mentioned the other example of omniscience, uh, omniscience because meaning knowing all things. Jesus in the Gospels is well known, Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and other places, confesses his ignorance about certain matters, but principally the day of the end, the date of the end, the end of the world, that day, no one knows, the son doesn't know, only the father. So how does a, a functional kineticism uh, interpret that? Because that would suggest that Jesus is not being entirely straightforward and honest, because his limitation is not due to having discharged or, or got rid of uh, disengaged. Yeah, no, they would say he didn't know at the time he said it. They would know uh, at the time that he uttered the statement. He didn't know. Mm. But in terms of his functional kinetism, he how, how could yeah, fun, yeah, and functional kinetism? Yeah. So he so basically, uh, uh, so basically, they would say that he that he limited his own knowledge. So he self limited his own knowledge, pretty much. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, okay, I, 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 to give I'm a not, human I, analogy to kind of make sense of it, but it'll be kind of... Yeah, I think that's got, pretty much what they would say. Yeah, so they would say that omniscience... So, so it's kind of like how... Imagine, it's kind of like how Muslims say um, forgiveness is something that God could choose to do when mm. he wants to, right? It's, it's interlinked to his will. If God wants to forgive, he could forgive. He's not always constantly forgiving every moment, right? For them, they see omnipotence and omniscience the same way. Right. So they would see it as it's something that God could control voluntarily. So if God wants to make himself ignorant, he can make himself ignorant about something. He, he has the power to make himself ignorant about something during a temporary period amount of time. Okay. But the property omniscience is still there, but they understand it as a dispositional property, which could be inert or active 
depending on God's will. So that's how they would reason. That's how they view the property. Okay, well, for us Muslims, and I think most Christians as well, is that you no know, omnipotence and omniscience are things that are um, uh, sifat dhatiya. Uh, they are essential attributes for God okay. that in that they are not interlinked with his will, like sifat, uh, yes. uh, 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 sifat al-af'al, uh, uh, actional attributes or, or volitional attributes like forgiveness and anger and all that kind of stuff. So. Anyways, I don't want to get no, that, 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 that's that's uh, helpful. Right. I mean, the, the idea yeah. that God changes is, is problematic, but if you have a mm. patristic mm. period as well, God doesn't change. But anyway, we won't go there. But thank you for clarifying the functional kinetic view, though. Right. Okay. Great, great. So, I mean, that's what they would say, pretty much. And so, but, you know, um, as you could uh, guess, um, uh, there are uh, yeah. difficulties with this model. <laughs> are there? Oh, really? Gosh. Okay. <laughs> Just, I'm shocked to hear that there might be problems with it. <laughs> so first off, um, Christians who who propose the standard ontological canonic approach have failed to provide an objective method that we could use to determine which of God's attributes are essential to him, as opposed to being accidental or contingent. Mm-hmm. And without a, without such a method, we we fall into the slippery slope of distorting the very concept of God and what properties we should believe he necessarily has, which make him maximally great and perfect. Secondly, to say that God divested himself of his attributes by by foregoing them implies an intrinsic change in his essence. Mm. God is supposed to be the greatest conceivable being who is maximally perfect in all his attributes. Well, to suggest that he is able to transform into a lesser being would entail that he is not necessarily perfect. And that and 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 to claim that is is an extremely bitter theological pill to swallow and it, and it certainly does not sit well with classic theistic perfect being theology and this is notwithstanding the fact that it is also heretical since it contradicts what chalcedon teaches regarding god not changing thirdly as for those who adopt the functional model of canonicism which uh, got you curious paul oh yes (laughs) Um, yeah which which states that god's attributes such as omnipotence and omniscience are dispositional and could be inert if God so willed. Well, this is also problematic for for at least two reasons. First, a God who knows all things is clearly superior to a God who is merely able to know all things. And, And God being God cannot have any being conceptually superior to him. Secondly, God being able to become omnipotent whenever he desires does not change the fact that he is still, ultimately speaking, omnipotent. To have the power to be all-powerful whenever you want still makes you all-powerful. So, so for example, like let's say you have a billionaire who temporarily restricts himself from access to his bank accounts and and assets. Can we say that at the time of his temporary self-restriction, which he was free to bring an end to at any time, by the way, can we say that he became poor at that time? No, we don't say that the billionaire became poor simply because he self-restricted his access to his bank account temporarily. Why not? Well, simply because he ultimately ultimately still had access to his wealth. Thus, functional canonicism fails to explain how such a process would have made Jesus just like any other human being, absent sinfulness, since Jesus was still ultimately infinite in his attributes and thus couldn't be like a human really there's, there's there's nothing more unlike any human being apart from sin than that individual who is also god i, I mm. mean it, it is so radically different from any human being that's possible that i've ever known and yet it's seen that he, he is 
like us in all respects apart from sin well what about the fact that he's also claimed to be god uh, that's a huge difference um, yes um, I, I just wanted to say something, something else. I mean, this is bringing it Islam in, in, in a second. There, there seems to be, we're talking about the, the second, it violates perfect being theology in Chalcedonian orthodoxy. There is a subtle interplay here between a kind of a more biblical theology, uh, I would think, and, and a kind of a Greek metaphysics, a Hellenistic metaphysics, which infuses Chalcedonian creed a, a, and Nicaea as well, in that this perfect being theology is a very kind of Greek Hellenistic conception of the perfect being. And you see this interestingly in classical Islamic theology, where under the influence of Falsifer, the uh, Ibn Sina and others, the idea that God uh, understood in a more Greek Hellenistic sense can't know particulars, because if he did know particulars, then you know that would involve a change in his nature and so on. And of course, that whole approach came under sustained criticism from Ibn Taymiyyah and others for, for detaching itself from the more Quranic understanding of um, God. And this be, it, it sorry, to, like, sorry to interject and interrupt you there, but uh, I did want to clarify that, you know, perfect being theology, uh, just as a recap, it, it teaches that God is maximally perfect, infinitely mm -hmm. perfect in all his attributes. Yeah. So I would say that, that that's very Islamic. Uh, it, it's very scripture oh, derived. Yes. That's, that's perfect being theology. We believe in it as Muslims. Yeah, but, I'm it, but biblically, it's not it's not a biblical idea that that was in, um, terms, of, in terms of Paul's theology or uh, which is much more um, as a matter of necessary implication. This is what we would say as a matter of necessary implication. Yeah. Your, whatever incarnational model you want to follow will, mm. will most likely fail that standard. Mm. But do Christians intend to believe in perfect being theology? Do they wish to? Yeah. Absolutely. They, they would say, yeah, of course, God is infinitely perfect and yeah, yeah. infinitely great. They would say that they and they would argue that it's also biblical. I, I have no doubts that it's probably it has a biblical grounding, especially you look at the Old Testament, talking about God being, you know, all powerful, all wise. All the, I, 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 I would I, I would I would probably say that, you know, perfect. If anything is biblical, it would probably be perfect being theology as opposed to maybe the incarnation. Uh, well, Sure, the incarnation is biblical when you look at Paul's letters and all those other books, but is that what Jesus taught? Is that something that the Old Testament would have permitted? Uh, we, we would argue no. Okay. So, yeah, I, I mean, perfect being theology is something accepted by Christians and Muslims. The only difference between us, and it's a big difference, is that Christian theology violates it, and they are not oh, yeah. uh, they are not pr giving... Uh, praising God the way he should be praised in his attributes by believing in such a doctrine. And that's our contention. Um, is there anything else you want to say? About, uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I didn't interrupt right, you. Right, I right, 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 right. Right. Please continue. Great. So, and uh, I would say fourthly and, and, and lastly, um, the canonic Christological incarnational model cannot explain away all attributes. I mean, it's very convenient to talk about omnipotence and omniscience, but those are not the only attributes of God. There's another attribute, necessary existence. Let's take that, for example. Now, we can all agree that necessary existence is an essential attribute of God. Yet, created human beings are contingent and not necessarily existent. In light of this, how can Jesus as a single person, as a single person, has been both necessarily and contingently existing simultaneously. Kenosis cannot help here, since God cannot divest himself of the property of necessary existence. I'm, I imagine saying, well, you see, God it does exist, exist necessarily, but if he wanted to, he could go out of existence. It's, it's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. And uh, it, especially when it comes to necessary existence, they especially face great difficulty trying to, trying to, trying to reconcile that. I think to, to, mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, although I, I agree with you, that, that's right, that there are people within the Christian tradition who have celebrated this problem, believe it or not. I'm thinking of two that the top of my head, Tertullian, the early church father, mm -hmm. who, uh, who was alleged to have said, I believe because it is absurd, 
Mm. The, sense, mm. the absurdity mm. of what you're saying struck him. Mm. And he said, well, that, I believe because of that, for some reason that became a meritorious act of belief. Another one is the famous um, hymn writer, John Wesley, who was an uh, English guy, he spent a lot of time in America, great hymn writer, the, the, the eponymous founder, well, the founder of Methodism in a way. And in his hymns, they, you get this sense of the immortal dies. That's a, a title of one of his hymns, the immortal die. That's deliberately paradoxical, deliberately so. So it's almost like, you know, they're making a virtue out of necessity. Yes, it doesn't make sense. And we're going to celebrate it, you know. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some who, who, make it, who make it into a cause of, of affirmation and belief, but I, 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 and, and they sing about it and they theologize about it, but I think probably most don't, are not comfortable with that conclusion. Yeah, the yeah. You've mentioned. The, the, you know, the, the, this embrace of self-contradiction yes. um, is uh, what, what many theologians and philosophers would label as fideism. Yeah. Yes. So, and like a Kierkegaard, who was a yes. famous. Uh, He's you know, another example. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a well-known fideist, right? So that is yeah. kind of like bordering fideism, and Absolutely. a lot of a lot of people would shy away from that, you know, just out of Kierkegaard's a very good example. Of their the intellectual yeah. reputation. If Kierkegaard had like you know he had great works, he had great great ideas, mm. um, but being a fideist at the end of the day, it's like uh, there's a limit to how seriously you're going to be taking him, uh, embracing self-contradiction. And celebrating it is, you know, speaks for itself. Um, you know, a few extra points regarding the canonic model were mentioned in my article um, for those interested. But for now, let's let's move on mm. to the two consciousnesses uh, model. Now, this model is also known as the two minds model and inclusion model. Um, this model was systematically introduced and defended by American philosopher Thomas Morris in his 1986 published book called The, the Logic of God Incarnate. That, that, that and, was a, that's a classic work. It's often seen, I, I think, as well as one of the most sophisticated defenses of the incarnation. Yeah, academically. I this is a serious work. I do, uh, I do agree. I do agree with that. I mean, uh, there's no... Um, I, I, I've read a lot of the, the literature up up until 2018. Mm. Up until 2018, I read the most essential literature on the on the incarnation, and you can't write a piece without mentioning Thomas Morris. Like right. uh, that's uh, his book, kind yeah. of like uh, was essential. Um, the model basically states basically states this: um, Jesus as the God incarnate had two minds a divine mind and a human mind. The divine mind retained divine attributes, such as omniscience and omnipotence, while the human mind was created and functioned like an ordinary human mind. The, the, human, the, the, divine, mind, the divine mind contained the human mind but the human mind did not contain the divine mind. Therefore, according to this model, Jesus had two streams of consciousness, divine and human. And in that sense, he was both God and man. In his divine stream of consciousness, Jesus was all-knowing. But in his human stream of consciousness, he was ignorant. This is, not contra this is not contradictory. So the claim goes, because these contradictory properties are ascribed to different streams of consciousness or, or minds. In Never one thought, person, in one person, by the way. In one person. <laughs> to stress, this is a, this is the caveat. In one person, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it seems like you read my mind. Uh, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> because uh, my uh, my first point talks oh, about the singular person. So, so obviously there are serious problems with this model. Um, firstly, the this compromises the singular personhood of Jesus. Even prominent Christian philosophers, such as William Lane Craig, who, whom you interviewed recently um, on, your, on your channel, 
he raised this objection against this model by stating that having two distinct minds would result in two different persons. What makes a person a person other than the fact that the individual has a self-center of consciousness? I mean, just this important point, William Lane Craig said that, I mean, that, that's fine. But um, the idea that Jesus, uh, sorry, that Jesus, the son had two wills, uh, this is how it's often expressed in the early church. You know, how many wills do you have? And it was decided, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the orthodox position is that Jesus did have two. He had divine will and human will, which suggests two consciousnesses. So to, dev- to deny that would actually take you in an unorthodox posi- in an orthodox direction, uh, actually, because the, the doctrine of two wills is orthodox Christology. Yeah, uh, I could assume... Uh- I would imagine that many Christians would probably try to argue that having two wills may not necessitate having two minds. Uh, Otherwise, um, everyone would have embraced this. Uh, A lot of Christians don't embrace the two minds uh, theory. So there must be some sort of explanation that they give. Uh, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Um, But but yeah, so I mean, what what makes a person a person other than the fact that he has a self-center of consciousness? Well, to have more than one stream of consciousness would entail that we're not speaking about a single person anymore. And and as we all know, mainstream Christian teachings state that Jesus was a single person, despite being the God-man. Secondly, since the divine mind contained the human mind of Jesus, this would entail that the divine mind also contained false beliefs held by that human mind. Jesus as a human being may have very well held false beliefs due to ignorance. Hmm. Um, The false beliefs could have been about mundane matters. You know, it could have been like the false scientific theories prevalent during the day, like the flatness of the earth or whatever, regardless. There's actually something. Or the fig tree or the story of the fig tree. When he cursed the fig tree, yeah, people deduce that. They would say, oh, that was the human side that was being ignorant. And what? Regardless regardless of what false beliefs he would have had, Christians would concede that he likely had false beliefs as, um, as, uh, as a human being. Yet to still contend that the divine mind contained the human mind that contains those false beliefs still entails the divine mind contained those false beliefs, and that is problematic. And that's something that Mm. different uh, Christian philosophers even raised. Thirdly, and I I think this is probably the the most significant problem, is what is called, um, is what many, some philosophers coined the the I thoughts problem. Jesus as a human being could have, as a human being, in his capacity as a human being, could have very well thought to himself, one day I am going to die. Okay, he could have thought to himself, one day I am going to die. But the divine mind of Jesus could not have such a thought since God cannot die. But since Jesus is a single person who has these two minds, According to this model, it becomes impossible for any of his two minds to express such I thoughts in the first person. So his divine, his divine mind cannot think to itself. Um, uh, no, sorry, his um, uh, uh, you know uh, his human mind, his human mind cannot think to itself. I am eternal and created the universe. Since his human mind, which belongs to the same exact person, Jesus, um, cannot formulate that that thought, right? So, So his divine mind could say, his divine mind could say, I am eternal, I am eternal, and created the universe. But his human mind cannot have the same thought because he's human and he's not eternal and, and he did not create the universe as a human being. But we're still talking about the same exact person here. So you're, so, talking, about, you're talking about someone here who's, who's, who, who then becomes fundamentally schizophrenic 
uh, or multi-personal, multi, multi-minded. You're no longer dealing with a recognizably human figure, uh, the, the, the one person, Jesus, who we encounter in the early Gospels. We're yeah. dealing with some kind of bizarre hybrid uh, composite being, precisely the very belief the, this hybridity is denied in the Chalcedonian Creed. As you read it at the beginning, it says he's not hybrid, but you he's end up having to have a hybrid hybridity by, by virtue of the inherent contradictions that emerge uh, from the natures as you, as you explore them here. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and, and again, like the human mind cannot refer to the divine mind in the third person by saying, he is eternal and created the universe. Mm. It's the human mind and divine mind are supposed to belong to the same single person, Jesus Christ. So how can any of the minds then distance itself from the person it is supposed to be by speaking about that person in the third person? So as you can see, it's, it's totally convoluted and leads us down a spiral of just further confusion and, and complications. Um, so these are the three dominant models of the incarnation. And as we can see, they are riddled with serious logical and theological problems. In, in addition to the fact that they, could, that they even hardly pass the stringent criteria laid out by Chalcedonian Christological orthodoxy. And, oh, by the way, by the way, the objections that I have been mentioning this entire time in my presentation are by Christian philosophers themselves <laughs> who, 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 <laughs> believe, who believe that the different models proposed by their fellow Christians fall short. This so is the no, only you, you, Bassam, as, a, as an outsider, as an observer, you're observing the, this incredible I'm just observing the debate uh, and bringing the dialectical the debate going on. You're, you're not inventing these ideas, you're saying yeah. this is what they are saying. These no, theologians no themselves, no one think, no one think that these are exclusively <laughs> Muslim objections. No, even Christians themselves can see the gaping holes in these proposed models. And the problem for Christians is that no Christian defends his own model successfully and completely from his critics. And, and there, there, there is, are, are you coming, you, I mean, there is an answer to this, but I, I don't even want to come to it. Do you want to do this now? But there is an answer to this. And and it has a small leg on it, but by, you know, does their belief have legs? Maybe it has a small one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it's the M card, the mystery card. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. all this is paradoxical, they may say. Yes, it appears to be contradictory. Ostensibly, you know, they use these, you know, so they're not conceding it, but it looks like, yes, but it is a mystery. And, and this, is, this, is a, this is the last resort I find in these conversations, in dialogues with Christians and others, is a mystery. And the, 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 the only way that could, that could be credible, and it's not something they invoke, is uh, uh, it occurred to me that they could come, they could use analogously the example of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, where in our new physics, whereas before in the Newtonian world, we had rational, logical, uh, ordered universe, which kind of made uh, rational sense. Now we have quantum events, which are incredibly paradoxical, uh, uh, non-linear, or even apparently incoherent. And they surely they could reference that as a kind of analogy, even nature doesn't submit to our rational strictures. And you know, when we look at it, um, and I always thought that would be a suitable analogy, but they don't seem to invoke that. But mystery certainly seems to be their ultimate card, as if that really gets them out of jail, like the get out of jail free card. But their own, the problems they have, they have set up for themselves. Chalcedonian, the Chalcedonian Creed is, is a Christian creed. Uh, it's not something invented by outsiders. And so they're being held to account, as you are doing, as they are doing, for their own stated beliefs. And um, the mystery card is, it seems a weak answer to their own claims. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a weak answer. I, I mean, I was going to touch upon this in my conclusion. but oh, you were? Sorry, I, I wasn't but, aware of that. No, that's fine. But, you know, uh, I'll just say in brief, and I'll probably just maybe elaborate a little bit more um, when mm -hmm. I conclude, which is that I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of intelligent folks could see the difference between things that are beyond our logic and things that are against logic. All right, things that we can, um, you know, fail to grasp fully, um, but 
there's no inherent contradiction in the concept itself. So, for example, God is eternal. Mm. I cannot fathom how. Mm. I can't. We, none of us can. How is God eternal? It's, it's, it's a mind-blowing idea. But I don't see anything self-contradictory about the idea, right? Like, I don't see any inherent contradiction. That's why no one attempts to even point out that there is an inherent contradiction in God's eternality, for yes. example. Um, so some, there are some beliefs that we hold that are clearly beyond our, our, our grasp of comprehension. But there are other things which are flat out contradictions, right? And so it's like, okay, so he's omnipotent, yet not omnipotent, and he is the same person. Mm, yeah. okay, this, is, this is different territory now. And I think most people can see and Christians themselves, the at least the you know, the philosophers, the academics, the theologians, those who are more rationally inclined, uh, uh, inclined they could yeah. see the problem, and they they've been toiling hard, working day and night, trying to come up with models to make coherent sense of this. Absolutely. And so you know, they they they're smart enough to see, to note the problem, right? But and they've tried, um, but you know, they, they fail. So I'll just touch a little bit more on that, maybe in the conclusion. Of course. But okay. That's pretty much the gist of, you know, the, the, the yeah, response. Yeah. But, um, you know, when, when Muslims do point out the, the, the serious problems associated with the incarnation um, in their dialogues with Christians, hmm. Christians feel pushed to a corner and try to point out that the Muslim is being inconsistent in his level of rational scrutiny, so to speak, of, of the doctrine of incarnation. Yeah. So they, they would allege that Muslims believe in matters where similar difficulties prevail. And so they argue, um, if Muslims are okay, having faith in such doctrines and matters, then why not extend the same level of courtesy by at least conceding that the incarnation is something that one could have faith in without fully fathoming its complexities. Mm. Um, they then give some examples to try to make their case. And I address the most common examples that they give uh, in an article of mine on my blog, which again, you, you kindly um, link to in the, in the yep. description. Yep. Um, it's called uh, Addressing uh, False Islamic Analogies Utilized by Christians to Defend the Incarnation. Um, but for today's presentation, I'm only going to address one of the arguments, just for the sake of time, simply mm -hmm. because I think it's the most philosophically complex and most common of the common arguments that they raise. Now, the argument they give concerns what Muslims believe regarding the Quran. So their argument would go as follows. Mainstream Muslims believe that the Quran is uncreated. Yet they also believe that there is a created element to it, the pages, the ink, etc. They also believe that the uncreated Quran is present with us spatially. If the Quran can be both created and uncreated simultaneously, then why can't Jesus as the God-man as well? Now, firstly, yes, it is true that the Quran uttered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uncreated, but speech in its bare rudimentary form as speech is not a tangible object we can see or touch. It is information at the end of the day. It is not a standalone entity you could point at. So, so yes, the Quran, in terms of its information content, is uncreated because it shares the uncreated essence of Allah from which it came out from. This is, this is Islamic orthodoxy. This, this was the reasoning of Imam Ahmad, that because the Quran was spoken by Allah and shares the same essence as Allah, it is therefore uncreated. I don't want to dive too deeply into that. Mm. Uh, that would be like another is advanced Islamic aqidah lesson. 
but that is what we believe and accept. Yeah. Secondly, for information content to be known and received by human beings through natural means, that information must either be seen or heard by human beings. So it should either be visually read or audibly heard. Thus, the uncreated Quran as information content could be relayed both visually by being written down using paper and ink or on your iPad or on your computer or whatever, and audibly through recitation. Now, when we hold a hard copy of the Quran, we call it the Quran by virtue of the information content that it contains. Yes, the ink and paper and book cover, they're all created, but these are media or vehicles which facilitate the enablement of human beings to see and recite the Quran. Now, is this similar to the Christian doctrine of incarnation? Absolutely not. First, you, you cannot compare something such as the Quran in terms of it being information content in its rudimentary form with something such as God's essence. God's essence is an actual self-subsisting being that exists in reality. And, and Christians believe that God the Son, in his essence, spatially came down to earth mm. and assumed human nature in the person of Jesus Christ. They, they say the word became flesh. Muslims, however, do not say that the Quran as a self-subsisting and independently existing entity became ink and paper. For, for Christians, God the Son as a singular person could be spatially located and pointed at when he became incarnate. You just point at Jesus. Muslims, on the other hand, do not claim to point at the Quran as the uncreated aspect of the, of the Quran because the uncreated aspect of the Quran is information. It's information content. If, if a Muslim memorizes the Quran, we do not say that a self-subsisting ontological concrete entity called the Quran is now spatially located in that Muslim's mind. Secondly, Christians do not merely say that God the Son remained in his essence and merely controlled the human body of Jesus like some kind of ventriloquist that is only you, you know, using Jesus's body as some kind of means or barrier via which to, to communicate to other human beings. No, they rather they believe that God the Son became man. Muslims, on the other hand, do not believe that the information content that is the Quran assumed the nature of ink and paper. Rather, we only call our physical Qurans, Qurans, on account of their containing the information that is the Qur'an. The ink and the paper and the book cover are created physical means which enable human beings to access the information content that is the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is accessed, is accessed through these created means. The Qur'an did not become yep. these created means or assume the nature of these created means. There's a huge difference between the two. Christian theology teaches that God the Son is a person that independently exists and became spatially located while acquiring human attributes. Islamic theology, on the other hand, states that the Quran is impersonal information content that does not exist in a self-subsisting independent fashion, but is rather accessed through visual and audible means, despite not acquiring the attributes of those means. Since the Quran is information, it's not a standalone self-subsisting person. Hmm. Thirdly, how about some consistency? I mean, look, Christians themselves also believe that God speaks and utters messages when, it, when, he, when he issues dictates and commandments. And this information content also finds its way into the physical hard copies of the Bible. So yep. do Christians now claim that this results in 
some kind of um, divine voice incarnating and created ink and paper? No, of course not. They, so, so whatever solution they propose for themselves could be equally proposed for Muslims, you know, unless of course they... It's interesting yeah. what you're saying, that the, the, uh, your understanding of what the Quran is, is actually found in the Bible as well, in the words, uh, I was assuming they're authentic, which I know is an yeah. if, yeah. assuming they are authentic, in the words of Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Moses and so on, the, the prophets themselves, uh, through, through whom God spoke, revelation, on, on some occasions. So, uh, so, that, so we already have the Quranic paradigm of God's speech in the uh, yeah. given model or given form in the Bible, and and yet they're, they're now claiming that the incarnation is somehow what is claimed for that. But but no no Jew ever or uh, Christian thinks that these are the same. These are equivalents. That the words of Jeremiah are equivalent to the incarnation of God in Jesus. You know, they're the same thing. Look, I mean, look. To be fair, they could evade this response of mine by trying to adopt a Mu'tazilite light line of thinking uh-huh. by trying to say that well, the speech is created, the Quran is created. Yes. And uh, but, you know, one could probably argue that that goes against a parent reading of the Bible. But, you know, I don't want to get into uh, yeah. ring our Muslim uh, attribute debates onto into Christian circles. But but, you know, I'm just raising that as a point in case. Someone it's, it's, a really, it's, a really, it's a really interesting point that the, 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 yeah. the prophetic speech in the Old Testament, if it is God's speech, as some of it claims to be, is exactly like the Quranic speech. It's, it's yeah. the same mode of revelation. Yeah. Fourthly, fourthly, it is not even self-contradictory to begin with. For the sake of argument alone, only for the sake of argument alone, let us say that Muslims believe that the Quran assumed created properties, whereby the paper and ink ontologically became part of the being of the Quran. Let, let us just assume that Muslims believe this. Yeah. As questionable as the doctrine may be, it is not self-contradictory like the incarnation. There's no problem with it anyway. In fact, the compositional model could work in a coherent fashion here. Muslims can say, if this is what they believed, Muslims can say that the Quran is a composite being comprised of uncreated information content plus created parts such as paper and ink. There's nothing self-contradictory about that. Mm. Why? Mm. Because we're not ascribing contradictory properties to the same exact referent. That is because the attribute of uncreatedness is being ascribed to the information content while the property of createdness is being ascribed to the paper and ink. Yeah. Combined, they are the Quran. But in the case of the incarnation, the same referent, that is the single person, Jesus Christ, yeah. is being ascribed with contradictory attributes. Yeah. So there's a big difference between the two. So yeah. not only, not only don't Muslims believe that the Quran literally and ontologically assumed the physical properties of ink and paper, but even if we did believe that, it's nowhere near as problematic and self-contradictory as the incarnation. No, that, that's so the a, analogy a fails point. either way. Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, actually, that's not, uh, I've not come across that before, well, yeah, but well done, very good. Yeah. So just to conclude, in conclusion, we can see that the doctrine of, of the incarnation, a central creed of the Christian faith, is riddled with serious intellectual and theological challenges. This is not merely a creed that is too difficult to fathom. You know, many creeds are difficult to grasp, like such as predestination, for for instance. Nevertheless, there's a difference between believing in things merely beyond our logic and things that outright contradict logic. The incarnation teaches the incarnation teaches that a single person was simultaneously attributed with contradictory attributes. This same person, Jesus, was supposedly omniscient, yet ignorant at the same time. He was omnipotent, yet limited in power at the same time. 
he was necessarily existing, yet not necessarily existing at the same time, and so on. This is completely different from having faith in things that we merely do not grasp, like God's eternality or predestination or whatever. Our confidence, I'm going to be a bit bold here, our confidence in the certitude of this doctrine being an unresolvable contradiction is further bolstered by the fact that two millennia have passed hmm. and Christians are still nowhere closer to resolving this problem. Yeah. Yes, it is true. It is true that in the past 35 years or so, there has been a significant revival in focusing attention on resolving the, the difficulty posed <clears throat> by this doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, with new creative ways being proposed on how to tackle it, and as we've just saw, seen in this presentation, but we could hardly deem this to be progress and, and positive development. If anything, the idea that this doctrine, the idea that this doctrine cannot be salvaged from self-contradiction has only been reinforced mm -hmm. when we can clearly see that the most brilliant Christian philosophical minds have toil to no end to resolving this problem, yet ultimately ended up failing. Yeah, I, I, just, I just remember, I read, I read a book once by the celebrated Cambridge physicist, and professor of mathematical physics, John Polkinghorne, who left the, uh, his chair at Cambridge and became an Anglican priest, and then became a, an equally celebrated Christian theologian. And in one of his books, he discusses these some of these issues and he concludes that Christianity is still waiting for a resolution to these, these contradictions. It, wow. He admitted wow. that, uh, that they hadn't been resolved despite of many centuries of, and he was humble enough to uh, admit this was still an outstanding issue. Um, mm -hmm. So that just confirms uh, what you said. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, in light of this, in light of this, Muslims and, and anybody for that matter <clears throat> are, just, are justified in rejecting Christianity as a false religion for teaching such a plainly false doctrine. Now, there's still a lot that I did not include in this presentation. There were two incarnational models that I did not discuss. And there were also two other false Islamic analogies that I did not discuss. I also did not delve into two positive arguments against the incarnation in this presentation. So if anyone's interested to read more about that, do check out my articles. <clears throat> yeah. I would like to just end my presentation by mm. reading the following ayahs oh. um, from the Noble Quran. Oh. oh, people of the book, do not go to extremes regarding your faith. Say nothing about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and the fulfillment of his word through Mary and a spirit created by a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Desist for your own good. Allah is only one God. Glory be to him. He is far above having a son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And Allah is sufficient as a trustee of affairs. Those who say Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary, have certainly fallen into disbelief. The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. <clears throat> Whoever associates others with Allah in worship will surely be forbidden paradise by Allah. Their home will be the fire and the wrongdoers will have no helpers. And on judgment day, Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you ever ask the people to worship you and your mother as gods besides Allah? He will answer, glory be to you. How could I ever say what I had no right to say? If I had said such a thing, you would have certainly known it. You know what is hidden within me, but I do not know what is within you. Indeed, you alone are the knower of all the unseen. So the Allah Azim, and I conclude my presentation in that manner. Wow, that, that's a, a very powerful um, conclusion. Thank you for sharing those verses. And I, I just reminded that middle passage there, you read the Messiah himself um, uh, said, children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And this is the, the other plank of the argument, which we obviously have not gone into today, and that is the historical um, evidence. And it, it's, mm. it's my impression um, 
that the overwhelming majority of historians and biblical scholars who've looked into how the historical Jesus mm -hmm. understood himself as a first century Jew in Palestine, the conclusion seems to be um, uh, that he would have seen himself, according to these Western biblical scholars, that Jesus saw himself as a prophet, uh, maybe an eschatological prophet, mm -hmm. but not as a deity, uh, not, 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 as, uh, not as Yahweh himself or, or Allah himself. Um, and that's also very, very interesting. The historical basis for yeah. the belief um, has, has been somewhat undermined, perhaps, by historians. Uh, you're, you're highlighting, of course, the philosophical uh, and metaphysical problems. Yeah. And, and, and personally, I believe that um, looking at things, uh, looking at uh, assessing doctrines theologically is... Um, more takes a priority over assessing them historically. And the reason why I say that is because def definitive knowledge always precedes speculative knowledge in epistemic worth. And even according to the concessions of, of Christian apologists, they would always say that their historical arguments are at best highly probable. Yes, this is true. Right. People, yeah. a Christian apologists like Mike Lacona and all these others, they would say, look, we would concede that our historical arguments, we think they're really good arguments, yes. but they're probable at the end of the day. That's From true. my perspective, this logical contradiction has reached the 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 you know the 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 the, the peak of certitude for me. And yeah. so for me, epistemically speaking, as interested I, as I am in, um, um, you, know, Christ, uh, you know, the historical development of, of Christology, <clears throat> um, for me, this takes precedent because even if scholarship shifts one day to showing that, you know, um, that, you know, that, 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 that these doctrines were early on and they were developed early and what, I, I, for me at the end of the day, I would still reject them <laughs> simply because this gives me certain knowledge that this doctrine is false. Um, and at best, historical arguments are going to be probable or speculative at best. So that, that's that's my, my personal opinion. So, no, um, I think you're right. The historical, historical research, particularly of, of individuals from thousands of years ago, is, is always probable. And, and Bart Ehrman has, has made that clear uh, as well. The very nature of the, the research is, is, is at best highly probable, but never absolutely certain. So you're right on that. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, you can, uh, there are two articles uh, I've linked to in the description below. One is entitled, uh, Can God Become Incarnate? Um, this is the, the core uh, text, I understand, on the Academia website by Bassam. You can read that. And the other, Addressing Ill-Formed Islamic Analogies Utilized by Christians to Defend the Incarnation, is on Bassam's blog, uh, which I, I encourage you to follow, subscribe to, um, and you can read that there. So happy reading. And um, the, the, uh, Bassam is a very erudite and clear uh, explainer of these issues, uh, and that is uh, why I encourage people to explore these issues further by reading those articles. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Paul. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Bassem, for your for your time and expertise. I, I'm, I'm sure um, we've all benefited hugely from this. So thank you, and um, until next time. <laughs>